The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar on showing and rating your skills, part of the Boost Your Career webinars that uh, Sue Mentors and Tulane University co-sponsor. Today, you'll be hearing from me, Sue Griffey, also known as Sue Mentors. There's a lot of focus on skills when you're writing your resume or your CV. When people talk about succeeding at an interview, there's a lot of discussion about make sure you know what skills you have and can talk about them. Here are two examples. On the left is soft skills. On the right is hard skills from, um, obviously, from the web. And there's a lot of emphasis on these when we're talking about writing skills lists, especially when it comes to what are your soft skills, what are your hard skills. I find it difficult to focus on that because I think that many skills are cross-cutting, and it's not just teamwork that's a cross-cutting skill, but on the right, you'll see at the bottom right, there's project management that's listed as a hard skill, and yet in much of what I see that uh, we professionals do project management is a cross-cutting skill that applies to many different um, job situ and career paths and job situations. So let's forget about skills as hard or soft or other and go on to talk about skills and what you can apply and how you can demonstrate those skills in your resume, in your interviews, in networking. Skills to me is a label, and so I want to make sure people understand that there's really two parts to a skill. The first part of it is learning, whether you go to co uh, college or university, some self-study. The two pictures on the right are, one, the middle one is simulated simulation learning, and on the far right, on-the-job training. You gain skills in these ways, you learn about them. But you also have to apply the skills because you don't have a skill just from learning about it. It'd be great if we just learned something and said, oh, we can do it now. Uh, many of us have tried that and it doesn't always work. So you apply them, again, in a simulated setting, in a real situation. Top right, you may be working by yourself doing coding. Top left, maybe group work. Um, there may be physical activities such as weighing a baby or um, putting um, data into a computer that's been collected on forms, paper forms, or uh, flow charting in the middle on the bottom uh, on a whiteboard. So for me, your skills really are learning them and applying them, and that becomes the experience. A skill doesn't convey the value you bring, but experience does. Some of you, if you've seen other webinars, may have seen this slide already. This slide is because I want to make sure we're focused on why not to focus on a skill, the reason for it. And what I tell people that I work with is, don't make me do your work for you. What I mean by that is, you need to demonstrate and describe your experience and value. And in doing that, you're remembering that there's another person in the conversation, such as in an interview or networking, a reader of your documents. You don't want to make that person have to pull out details that they think are important and say, oh, this is what Sue looks like. You want to give them that information in a way they can absorb. I like this cartoon because it helps me explain skills and the difficulty with describing skills. This person has Excel expertise. For me, use is the operative word, but how do I know what kind of expertise he has and how much use he has, how, at what level? So it's a good way towards getting to our discussion on skills. It's also important to understand that skills come from lists that job hiring managers and HR people write because they need someone to do some work. Again, the importance of your experience is being able to respond to the job description for a job you're applying for. I want to go back again. This is a previous webinar we did, and there's some, a few more slides and a lot more explanation on this. But many of us who are listening to these webinars are knowledge workers, and we don't always know the right way to identify what we bring. So 
what you'll find is people like on the top left, a long skills list of stuff. There's all these things and I'm looking at this thinking, well, what does this person really know how to do and what, you know, how can it help me if I'm hiring her? The long Mardi Gras beads, love Mardi Gras beads, but not when they represent all the latest buzzwords. I don't know what working in a fast paced environment means. Fast paced to you could be slow to me or vice versa. My biggest um, uh, pet peeve, I guess you would say, is don't give me self-value judgment words. To me, they're like shoes that don't fit. The shoes are too big. You're trying to fit in shoes that make you sound great. And this is um, where skills lists um, can uh, have more detail that help these discussions on when someone says, I have excellent project management skills. And I'm thinking, well, what is that? That can be very elaborate. I have the good interpersonal skills. We're going to look at examples of all of these. So here are some examples. These three come from resumes and CVs of uh, people I've been working with. And I want to mention that all of these people have given approval where I've shown information in depth, um, given me approval to use these. They may call them qualifications. They may call them skills. but what you see here is not actually what these people can do and what they want to be doing. So you'll see good understanding, strong, able to create, excellent, extensive. I don't know what those mean. The bottom middle, we're going to see this one again later because I'll show you an after. But this one, at least the person did move a ways towards giving us some evidence of what she could do. Five years hands-on undergraduate teaching experience. I'm showing you these different formats now just so you can see them and understand why um, changing the format to something what looks fancier now in nowadays isn't a good idea, partly because resume scanning systems don't pick up certain formats. But there are other ways that people are trying to show skills. And when they show me key skills, my question is always, is this all you have? In all of these, I'm thinking, is this all you have? I know these people, I work with them, and yet they don't, they don't have the right description of what those skills are. Top left, she has empty boxes that to me look like they need a check in them. Does she have them? Of course she has them, but what about other skills you need for good research? Bottom left is interesting, but I can't see her career progression in, for example, in her program planning design, etc. She did grant writing for eight years, but she's been working for 17. So if she did grant writing for the first eight and hasn't done it for the last nine, that doesn't help me because I need someone who can write grants to what are, we're writing for now, for example. And her highest experience is way at the bottom, and yet that's what she actually wants to be hired to do. And on the right is a format that came out a couple years ago. Um, all I'll say on this is it's very hard to understand. It looked appealing to the people that thought it was useful to show how they have great skills, but almost no one's going to put um, a box kind of approach there and say, I only have two out of 10 in proposal development. They might as well just write the fraction two of 10 and say, that's all I've got. But no one's going to show their lowest level skills. And that's the one that especially will not pass a resume scanning system. So instead of skills, let's look at how we can get the skills information into your resume and your CV by starting with telling a story. I know this very colorful uh, arrows here, there, and everywhere underlining um, won't, will, will be very confusing initially. But what I wanted you to see, especially if you stop uh, the, tape, the um, webinar and look at it, is the way in which that just at the very beginning of this person's resume, she took the time to write what I call a bio para, other people call a summary paragraph, but she wrote her story. So you know immediately what she's done and she's made it evidence-based, she's um, described key results that are important 
And in doing that, she's included keywords that are going to be picked up so that she doesn't need a skills list, for example, saying that she's an excellent communicator. Because if you look on the right, and this was one of the three job descriptions I showed you or job um, qualifications list that I showed you earlier on, on the right, underlined in yellow, is effective and persuasive communication skills. You can see that this person has a lot of writing of journal articles, but also different kinds of reports that she presents at conferences. And as importantly, she presents results at stakeholder meetings and debriefings. So she has public speaking, she's got oral and written, and it's very clear where she's done this and how much she brings to the job. Um, let's take another area experience with str creating strategic partnerships. This is underlined, it's the first uh, green as you go from top to bottom. And that links to where she worked on an assessment that led to galvanizing community engagement and influencing policy and program action. So she's not just had experience with it, she's actually saying, and we actually influenced um, the future of what we were working on to assess by having this uh, relationship. So I welcome you to look through this, um, match up the color coding with uh, different job descriptions. And remember that this is how you also can decide when you get a description of a position you think you're interested in, you can see how closely matched up you are with what's important to them in the qualifications. Just as a side note, remember that it's usually um, reverse order. The most important things they want are at the very top and it goes down from there. And they even say in this one, the following are a plus but not required. So here's the start at understanding whether you're responsive to the job that you think you want to uh, apply for. Going farther into your CV or resume, here are descriptions of another person. Both of these people are um, senior director level people. Um, but this is where she described her specific positions. And if we take um, the first arrow on the, la on the right, experience creating strategic partnerships, that points to where she actually did that work, linking African researchers and uh, American uh, or US-based universities. She has proven fundraising, that's the third arrow down on the right. Um, fundraising and it said she led a successful bid for a hundred million dollar expansion of the project. People are going to want to know that that's going to be impressive. So again, figure out if you match up with the description, but also know that that writing your job descriptions and not leaving them blank and just listing what you did and who you did it for for how long is also a way for you to put in your skills for the keywords that um, a resume scanning system may be looking for to be in your CV. So let's go back to this on the left, the summary of qualifications, which you saw earlier with the three examples I started off with. In the same amount of space, the person now on the right has written a summary paragraph. And I showed you the first page of her resume so you can also see where she's been able to demonstrate her public health skills. But you see, instead of extensive experience, she now has 15 years of experience, much more descriptive, understandable, and says, now I understand that is extensive. Importantly, she managed three concurrent projects. Managing one project at a time may not be as complex an activity as three concurrent projects. So concurrent projects can help you when you're matching a job that says must be able to ma uh, manage a multitude of tasks simultaneously. And she had a lot more work that um, she described in her undergraduate teaching experience. So you see that she was very busy with teaching three to cour four courses a semester, not just five years of experience. And as I said, all of the public health work that didn't appear anyplace else, and yet she wants to be working in public health because she just graduated in it. So let's now talk about the um, other things that we see in skill lists. 
And these are ending up, um, these will end up, you probably will have a short skills list and short is the operative word. So you wanna make it count. Here are skills lists from people I've worked with. None of them are great because they all have issues about what do you really need when you list this stuff. Maybe people don't parse it as finely as I do, but first of all, the purple boxes, people did try to give some sense of a rating. And most of the time that I see people rating themselves in what they can do, they use the word proficient, partly because if you search for how to rate yourself on skills, proficiency comes up as an operative word that everybody thinks should be used. And I will show you in a little while why I think it's too vague to be used. You'll see um, arrows here. The arrows are pointing to things that I have questions about. Almost everybody that goes to a master's graduate program uh, will graduate with some skills in data analysis with SPSS or SAS, one of the data analysis programs. But most of us don't want to be hired to do it. So don't list it first or don't list it at all if you don't want to be hired in your job to do it. Again, we'll be talking more about this. Um, in the data analysis that the person has at the top um, left, uh, that was more just because I, I wasn't sure what she was intending trying to put Excel in with it. Excel is a basic analytic program, but um, I would expect her at that point to be an advanced user and be able to do um, pivot tables and much more elaborate Excel um, than you would expect. Most people would go straight, wouldn't consider Excel part of data analysis. And at the top right, I put an arrow towards social media, Twitter and LinkedIn. People are gonna look at that and think, well, first of all, most of us don't do Twitter. And second of all, you should know how to use LinkedIn because you should be doing it for your professional self. Red boxes around Microsoft Office. This is just something to be aware of. Microsoft Office has several different software packages in it. And one package that people don't realize or one software program is called Access. It's a database program. And it's been in there forever. And when people tell me they know Microsoft Office, I always say to them, oh, good, tell me, um, tell me how you can construct a database and access. And oftentimes there's um, not much voice on the other end of the phone because they're not aware it's in there. So instead of using Microsoft Office, detail the programs you um, know how to do, like the people in the two middle boxes said Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. Stay away from the word technical. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. If you want to list skills, just say skills, and I have some suggestions for other titles. And finally, the bottom right um, blue box around those wouldn't typically be listed in a skills area. Those are experience areas from your um, job descriptions. And you, if you have that experience, you should be um, using it in describing your research assistant job that you did during grad school or however you gained um, that experience. So let's have some don'ts and then what do we do with the don'ts? Don't leave a skill only like I'm a um, I'm a, I know how to use Excel. And don't give these words for vague ratings. Proficient, familiar with, knowledge of, understanding of, expert in. Technical skills as a title is bad because technical is used by different people in different way. In the world that I come from, especially in global health, your technical area is the area of health you work in. Um, so don't confuse people. And don't list every skill you have. People for a while were making very long skill lists because they thought that that then signaled there were a lot of keywords the resume scanning systems would pick up. So to avoid the vague and no ratings, make sure you replace it with something that is like a three level, um, three levels of uh, user experience, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So what would that look like? Here's um, an elaborate slide on the right is, sorry, on the left is the um, basic word user and on the right is an intermediate word user. I would expect people who graduate from undergraduate 
um, college with a basic undergraduate degree to be basic users and at least be able to do a multi-page document with a footer that has a page number in it. A couple things that I'm looking for and the reason that the document on the left has all the paragraph uh, marks in it is because there are people that will continue to use Word like an old typewriter and they'll put in line returns instead of a page break so that you know how to make a page break or a section break. And at the very top um, of the right-hand page of the basic user is that you know how to put in a repeating table header so that you don't force people to have to go back and say, now what column was that that I'm looking at? Moving on, then an intermediate user would be able to put together a multi-chapter document using heading styles um, from Word, and I've shown you um, my main heading one and heading two on a document that that's full of, that's just all my um, mentoring ideas that I'm writing. Um, but then they'd be able to construct a table of contents and keep the table of contents up to date in using that as well. If you wanted to know what a basic Excel would look like, um, facility with Excel, I expect people nowadays to be able to do a basic one, one worksheet budget that has categories and subcategories that total into subtotals and then final totals. And also to use Excel to set up a basic data entry screen or a basic um, database screen where you might keep track of inventory or resources or documents. I'm sure that there's a lot more. I'm going to be showing you rating systems that I've found that have been useful. But just have some standards in mind when you say what you can do and how you can do it. All right, we talked about avoiding technical skills. Here's some titles you could use instead. Um, you'll see one on the next page, uh, which uh, is skills and competencies. If you have certifications, like you're a certified health educator or a certified project management professional, that could go under there. And only list skills that you've actually applied and that you want to use in a job. So if you went to training, and learned Excel budgeting, but you never used it, don't put it down as a skill. Here are better skills lists. Um, top right, bottom left, I have a good sense that these people can do something with Spanish um, in some way. Um, same thing by top right with um, a conversation versus professional use. On the left middle box, the very long middle box, this person not only rated her level, but she actually talked about how she was able to use it. So she was doing a lot with databases and she actually designed databases and described those. And so we can see, oh, this person knows a fair amount about that and she's using them. The bottom right um, was the skills and competency title. I like that because this allowed uh, the person who's in global health but hadn't done a lot of work globally yet to show that she had international experience in different ways and also show the languages that she knew. In addition, she showed her, she differentiated her technology skills, which is how I describe the general area of computer stuff. Um, she did show some basics, uh, basic skill areas like Open Data Kit under Data Collection and Tableau under um, Data Viz and Mapping. And she said to me, and it's, it's true, it's very important to show those in her world because more and more people want to know if you know Tableau or Open Data Kit. So at least she could say, yes, I actually did some work in it and, and used it, um, but if you want to hire me for data collection, I'm most comfortable in SAS and not Stata or the others. And um, the only change on this, you saw I put a red X through technical, but that's not going to get that. This person actually got the job she was looking for, so this clearly didn't hold her back. Remember that rating your skills is somewhat of a subjective rating of yourself, but you're, you're using as much objectivity in determining your skill levels, and especially where you can go and check out some websites I'll recommend. It'll give you more ability to decide, am I a basic user or an intermediate user or advanced user? 
There is an NIH, the National Institutes of Health rating uh, for competencies that may be helpful to you. And one of the most useful things I found several years ago, unfortunately hasn't been updated since 2011, was Concordia University actually detailed the four different Microsoft Office packages and what they um, described the basic intermediate and advanced level was and then what the specific skills that people needed at each level. I have a handwritten document where I was going to um, update this and adapt it in terms of I would change some things around, but I think still it's a very useful resource and it's the only one I found at this level of detail that anybody um, shared on the web. Uh, this is the PowerPoint and access as well, and you'll find a link to this. So as we come back to um, finishing up, you're going to replace skills lists with your actual experience as much as possible. You're not going to, you're going to um, help people understand the value that you bring, which is the important thing for you to be not just hired, uh, also promoted for you to um, network effic efficiently and effectively. On the next two slides, I'm going to show you selected um, sites I found and guidance for uh, different ways of rating yourself. The first one is the, the um, computer skills list that I just showed you a minute ago. There's an interesting link on language proficiency and one of the people who posted comments, um, listed several different rating systems and links to them. So if you want to try to get your language proficiency rated in terms of where you stand, you can go to um, those programs. A section on certain examples for computer skills, what was important in that is broad categories of presentation software, data analysis, word processing rather than saying Microsoft Office because we, if you know Office, you can use Google, Google um, Docs. If you know how to do um, for, um, spreadsheets, you can use Google Sheets and, and same thing with the Apple environment. These two I thought were interesting if you're in the IT world, but um, um, just as a way to look at another way that you can assess yourself and what you need to do. The bottom right is um, a similar site from as the language site I just described. And what's important about that is you need to read through information and decide what's going to be helpful to you in having the way to put your best foot forward. And what I say over and over again is this is how you own your own professional development and make decisions about how am I going to effectively convey what I'm what I have experience in so people can understand it and get my story uh, understand my story right away. So in summary let's just focus on describing your value through your experience and achievements. Resume scanning systems will pick up your keywords in your bio para and your job description, so you don't need a long skills list. So when you do use a skills list, put it either at the end of or towards the end of your resume. It doesn't need to go up top. You want people to understand your experience, not just try to say, well, I wonder if you really, where is, where is the experience on communication here? Thanks once again for attending our webinars. Don't forget to check our channel for the other Boost Your Career webinars and many other professional development webinars that Tulane Alumni Career Services has been doing. Contact Sue or Sarah for more information on this topic or ideas about another webinar you'd like, and we look forward to seeing you the next time.